Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause coming to you from my little nutshell of infinite space right here in the Wood of the Holly. And today I have a very special guest. She's back for the second time, and I'm so excited to have her. She is one of the most important chroniclers of the American story, which includes slavery, abolition, the Civil War, and now in her latest book, Reconstruction. I was privileged to read her incredibly thorough account of the history of the abolition movement a few years ago in a book called The Slave's Cause. And now she has written really a similarly thorough and vivid account of what I consider to be the most triumphant and yet tragic period in American history, Reconstruction. The book is The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic. I read it, and I have to say, with this book, Professor Sinha joins the ranks of our leading American historians that include W.E.B. Du Bois, Eric Foner, Barbara Tuckman, Howard Zinn, Robert Caro, and David Blight, to name a few. And beyond that, Professor Sinha is the recipient of more academic honors and chairs and fellowships than I have time to mention. Her op-eds and articles have been published all across the journalistic firmament, but she's here with me today. So pleased and grateful to welcome Professor Manisha Sinha. How are you? Thank you so much, Bill, for that generous introduction uh, and for having me on your show again. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> okay, well, the, it was well earned. Uh, and as I look at the title, uh, I really enjoyed the book. It's incredibly thorough. And it is, a, like I said earlier, it's a tremendous companion piece to your uh, to the slaves cause, which really covers abolition into uh, reconstruction. And I just want to talk about the title because it's the rise and the fall of the second American Republic, which to me, you know, has echoes, uh, international echoes, uh, of course, with France. And I just want you first to ex just expand upon that sort of lens that you're putting your story through. Yes, so when we look at American history, uh, most people think of the American Republic as, you know, being founded in the 18th century and just continuing right down to our times. It's kind of a linear story, and it's uh, sometimes told as a kind of a triumphant story that, yes, there were problems, but they were gotten rid of, and, you know, democracy and freedom expanded for everyone. And I think by telling that simple story, we have missed out a lot in US history uh, because it's the path towards greater freedom has never been linear or untroubled. You know, there has been reaction at moments, uh, rights won have been lost as we are now experiencing today again. Uh, we thought that could never happen, that, you know, things can go backwards. And it has happened before in American history. So my way of trying to understand uh, the, the sort of contest between sort of progressive forces and more reactionary forces that have fought back against any sort of change was to understand American republicanism as not just one seamless story, but as having its ups and downs. Uh, at moments when the Constitution is remade and we literally have a reimagining of the American Republic. And that's why I call the period of the Civil War and Reconstruction as the second American Republic, because after the Bill of Rights, that's when we get constitutional amendments at a rapid flux and, and really changing some of our ideas about citizenship and governance and government. Um, so I use that analogy sort of roughly from that of French republicanism whose history is as old as that of the United States. Um, now, in France, of course, republics you know, came and fell, and new constitutions were written. I think they have like four or five constitutions also, besides five republics, etc. So it's not an exact match. But I think it's a useful metaphor in terms of thinking about some of the, both the triumphs, as you put it, and also the tragic defeats of American republicanism. Um, so the first American Republic is very different, and it actually fell apart during the Civil War. And the second American Republic, even though we end up with the same constitution, we still have some changes and some really major constitutional amendments. And that also falls apart. I mean, I tell the story of its gradual unwinding in the late 19th century. Um, 
I would say our third republic was formed only with the civil rights movement, when some of the changes put into place during Reconstruction after the Civil War were actually implemented, or new laws were passed to implement them. Uh, and now we are living in a state where we might see the downfall of the third American Republic. I don't want to write about that. No. <laughs> uh, I, I want that Republic to last. Uh, but I just think it's a it's a useful rubric for people to really understand some fundamental changes in U.S. history uh, and not to think of the story of American democracy and republicanism as kind of an untroubled, um, you know, even killed one, because in fact, the history shows that that was not the case. Right. Well, and also just as a time lens that you look at Reconstruction, I mean, just typically, I think it was considered, you know, at the end of the Civil War for about 10 or 11 years. But you've actually widened the lens to begin Reconstruction, it, it probably with Lincoln's election. And then taking it all the way to sort of the last cherry on top of those constitutional amendments, which was the 19th in 1920, which, of course, expanded the, the voting franchise uh, to women. And um, maybe just as we move farther away in time, we expand the lens. Uh, you know, for example, if we study the dinosaurs, we, we have huge gaps of time over untold millions of years. And as we move away in time, we're maybe expanding some of our time frame definitions. But I appreciated that because it is a fresh lens to see those events through. Yes, and I think the reason why I expanded the chronology of Reconstruction was to so reassert its significance. If we look at Reconstruction, the way it's normally taught in U.S. history textbooks, as oh, it started in 1865 at the end of the Civil War, and by 1877, the last Reconstruction governments in the South have fallen, and that's the end of the experiment. Uh, so it was like this brief moment and this brief experiment that failed um, actually, it was more overthrown than failed, uh, I argue in my book. And, you know, it, it, the, the significance of that moment is lost. And that's one of the reasons I expanded the, the time period, that if you really look at the, if you look at it as, as different republics, right, coming and going, then really the first republic falls with the election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1860, because the deep South states, beginning with South Carolina, secede from the Union in rapid order, right? And right. by February 1861, you have uh, an attempt to form a new nation, uh, a slave nation, the Confederacy. And so I felt it was important to, to, to begin at that point, uh, to look at the downfall of the First Republic, mm -hmm. uh, which begins with the election of Lincoln for the first time, uh, overtly anti-slavery president in U.S. history. And we often forget of Lincoln as a Reconstruction president, but he did have these experiments in wartime Reconstruction, and some of the biggest achievements of Reconstruction took place under his presidency, right? The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, despite the criminal exception, which, of course, the Southern states then weaponized by criminalizing black freedom and the Freedmen's Bureau, the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau, the first time you have a big federal government agency being established to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom. So I really wanted to look at, at Lincoln as a reconstruction president too, which he's normally not looked at because he's assassinated in 1865. And I end in 1920 precisely because I think I also wanted to end the book in a high note, you know, <laughs> uh, because the story of the unwinding of Reconstruction is so dismal. You know, it just it's not just the so-called compromise of 1877. Now, historians dispute whether there was any such political compromise, but it's not just the election of Rutherford B. Hayes and the fall of the Southern Reconstruction governments in 1877, you can see the unwinding of Reconstruction right up to 1900, right? Uh, establishment of Jim Crow, the Supreme Court um, emasculating Reconstruction laws and amendments. Um, you know, you can see uh, how the Republican Party and the federal government and the nation itself moves from reconstructing the South to dreams of empire abroad, all based on the 
notion of the racial inferiority or incapability of some people um, to be good citizens or to have equal share in governing. Uh, and I wanted to tell that entire story. I mean, you get Plessy versus Ferguson only in 1896. Yeah. Um, the Southern states formally and legally disfranchised Black people only in the 1890s. Hmm. So if we end in 1877, we just missed a very important story, which is not just the brief triumph of Reconstruction, but also the long unwinding of Reconstruction and how that influences you know, different spheres in, in, in the nation, you know, whether it's uh, labor strife, whether it's attitude towards immigrants, whether it's the launch of a formal overseas American empire, all these are connected with the downfall of Reconstruction, I argue. And then, as, as I said, I wanted to end on a high note, so I ended with 1920. I ended with um, the 19th Amendment uh, that gave women the right to vote, even though, of course, it's uh, passed in the shadow of the fall of Reconstruction. So Black women in the South, for instance, like Black men, remain disfranchised until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But what I, struck me reading the 19th Amendment is that it was phrased exactly like the 15th Amendment, which gave Black men right. the right to vote. The 15th Amendment of 1870 and then 1920, 50 years later, you have an amendment giving women the right to vote and the phrasing is exactly the same. So it's it's Reconstruction's progressive constitutionalism that kind of lives on, um, even in the most dismal circumstances. But I also wanted to tell the important story of the suffrage movement that really comes into its own during Reconstruction. There's a lot of divisions. There's a lot of uh, expedient tactics. There's a lot of giving in to racial segregation in the South and racism among Southern white women. But I, it was still important to tell that as a part of the story of Reconstruction, both in its triumph and its unwinding. So that's why I ended it till, in 1920. <laughs> well, also, you, you I know it's it's prominent in your book also, but the Indian Wars in, in the decades after, after all, Custer is defeated uh, in 1876. So th these things are all part of the same river in certain ways the 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 the, the ultimate subjugation of of the of the plains specifically you know um i wanted to just since we're talking about these amendments and maybe the crown jewel of all of them not to diminish any of them is the 14th which all of a sudden that lens of history got focused on it uh, very recently and i know that you wrote about that in an amicus brief or in support of that, uh, section three, which had pretty much been forgotten uh, in the intervening uh, generations, but it wasn't put there just for the Civil War because otherwise they could have just maybe passed the law. It was put there as a guardrail for democracy. As Mark Graber says, if you choose bullets and not ballots, you, you can't play in this game called democracy. It's just not, you, if you want to bring a knife onto the soccer field, you know, you can't play. I'm sorry, those are the rules. And I feel like the past just came right into the present. And I felt like that's a good way to get into, of course, what you wrote about, because there it is staring right in our face at this very moment. Yeah, you know, I wanted to include all these stories in the book. So you referred to the Indian Wars earlier on, and there were many historians of the West and Native Americans who would say that if you look at it from the perspective of the West and Native Americans, there's a greater reconstruction that begins with the Mexican War of 1846, which is before the Civil War, when Indians start getting dispossessed in a massive way in the West, and it continues up to 1877. Um, with uh, some of the last wars, like the war against the Nespers. Uh, and the person who's popularized it is a Western historian by the name of Elliot West. Uh, and I, um, I, I felt that there is a way to incorporate the history of the Native Americans, the West, but I was doing going to do it a bit differently because they see the reconstruction of the West and South as similar processes, uh, you know, the expansion of the native nation state, you know, the suppression of the Confederacy and then the Indian indigenous sovereignties in the West. And I, I, I don't agree with that. 
I think they were completely different uh, processes, different political projects, literally, and that the dispossession of Native Americans had more to do with the unwinding of Reconstruction. So like the Wounded Knee Massacre doesn't take place until 1890. And in fact, it is after 1890 when there's a complete loss of sovereignty that dispossession, land dispossession, what Michael Whitkin calls the plunder, you know, the plunder of Native lands, it accelerates, it doesn't go down. And so I, I wanted to tell the story of the conquest of the West, both as a winding of Reconstruction, but also as a beachhead for the rise of American empire in the Pacific. Same generals that are involved, they are involved in Cuba, in the Philippines, in the Spanish-Cuban-American War. Other historians are saying, oh, well, there's Sherman and there's Sheridan. But those more important, I think, are people like Nelson Miles and others who who really take on the 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 burden of empire. And and I saw the Indian wars as colonial wars, not as similar to the Civil War at all, but really as colonial wars. Uh, when you read about European conquests of Asia and Africa, the the level of brutality, the massacres of entire villages, women, children, systematic starvation or systematic deprivation or um, a forced assimilation, all those are very reminiscent of colonial rule. And I wanted to tell that story within that interpretation. Um, so, but your second question about the, the constitutional amendments and why, you know, the amendment, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I call this the rise of a second American Republic, because um, you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments that really do remake the U.S. Constitution, but the 14th amendment, as you said, is the crown jewel. You know, it's the one amendment that I feel that if we enforce even today, our democracy would be safe. So think about it. Of course, Section 3 that arose recently because of the January 6th insurrection and Trump's role in it, which explicitly says, you know, that if you um, have participated in, insur in an insurrection or incited one against the government of the United States after being a federal office holder and taking an oath of office to the United States Constitution, which the president also does, then you are ineligible to even stand for office um, and that a restriction would remain unless Congress by a two thirds majority removes it. Now Congress did do that for the ex-Confederates, unfortunately. I think it's one of the um, stepping stones and the downfall of reconstruction that in 1872, they passed a general amnesty act, which pardons all ex-Confederate office holders, um, you know, those that had not been pardoned by Johnson already. Uh, and that blanket amnesty, you know, lays the door open for um, people, really bad characters like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who had been, you know, a slave trader um, involved in a massacre of Union Army soldiers, uh, basically a war criminal, and also then um, one of the founding members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so his, you know, those are the kinds of people who would then soon be gracing uh, Congress from the southern states. Um, so it became relevant now. And even now, of course, uh, the Supreme Court, including the liberal judges, I will add, were nervous about actually enforcing that uh, that part of the 14th Amendment. But the 14th Amendment has other parts to it which I think are also very relevant for today. For instance, um, the creation of national citizenship, regardless of race and previous condition of servitude. That was a really important expansion of American citizenship, um, particularly to, um, to formerly enslaved people, right? They were no longer slaves, but they would now be citizens of the Republic. And of course, other groups would take advantage of it. Now, there are politicians today, I think Trump had an idea in his first term that he wanted to get rid of this section of the 14th Amendment by an executive order until he was informed that you can't get rid of a constitutional <laughs> amendment with an executive order. You actually have to have another amendment. Um, so it, that's a, and it's equal protection clause also that has expanded rights for American citizens in ways that its um, writers could not visualize. In fact, when I read the Congressional Globe, the debates of the, over the 14th Amendment, 
the people who wrote the 14th Amendment, particularly somebody like John Bingham, who also gave the term Bill of Rights to the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Right. He didn't call it Bill of Rights before he did. Uh, and he wanted to nationalize those rights. And he also wanted to, he said, and many of the framers or who proposed differing versions of the 14th Amendment said that you know, we want to use the broadest egalitarian language possible because we don't know in the future what rights might arise and what groups might claim equal protection under this amendment. Right. So we've had like gay rights, you know, we've had gay marriage, we had Roe v. Wade until recently. Of course, mm -hmm. that's overturned now. But those rights all stem from the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. So it's really important for our modern democracy Absolutely. and for modern citizenship rights for all groups, right? Um, and then, of course, it has in its uh, another section that says, if you deprive or suppress the votes of any male citizens, they introduce the word male right. in the U.S. Constitution, which some suffragists didn't like, you would suffer a loss of representation in Congress. Right. And that should have been implemented. I don't think it ever has been in any way. It never has been, and it hasn't been. Even now, we could implement it. There's so many states, particularly in the former Confederacy, right. that have come up with novel ways to suppress votes, right? Right. Um, and all the victories of the civil rights movement, I mean, the Voting Rights Act has already been also emasculated again by uh, the Supreme Court in, in, in Shelby County versus Holder. So... Um, if we implement that, then these states wouldn't be up to all the shady business of trying to suppress votes. And then there's the debt ceiling clause, too, which we forget. Right. You know, Republicans right. Have held the country hostage over right. the federal debt. But if we just implement the 14th Amendment, you can't do that, according to the Constitution. Right. I so, believe that was originally because it didn't want to put Confederate debt on the U.S. government. It, exactly. We were relieved so of that debt. debt. Exactly. So it completely gets, you know, disavows all Confederate debt, uh, but it says the federal debt is inviolable, right? You have right. to, you have to honor, and you know that's the full faith of the United States government is behind that. Um, so we could even use that today to prevent this kind of hostage situation amongst ill actors, you know, political actors who want to. Uh, either mess with the functioning of the United States government or decapitate it for short-term political gain uh, and ruin our economy too. So there are various democratic protections in this wonderful amendment, which is a gift that keeps giving if he would only accept it. Right. I think people don't fully get uh, the full magnitude and, and, any, and majesty of it in a way. You know, it is magisterial in its you know, John Bingham, Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, these giants who, you know, like we want to talk about founding fathers. So, you know, in, at least in the government, those are, you know, let's get another mountain and start, you know, getting their faces on it. I think they're deserving of it. One thing I want to talk about, we, we touched on it briefly, was uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, which is I mean, largely forgotten today, uh, which was a bureau, I think it was first set up within the U.S. Army, and then it later becomes an, an arm of the federal government. It may be the first social welfare uh, bureau that anticipates the New Deal and, and, and so much of what we talk about as uh, people looking to the federal government to make their lives better. But one of the things that struck me reading your book was that it was also a place where people could bear witness of the atrocities the massacres and the lynchings. I don't think today, you know, people sort of live with the idea of the slaves are free, yahoo, it's great. I don't think they really have a clear idea of the absolute reign of terror that descended on the formerly enslaved and also people that were sympathetic to them, some of whom were, many of whom were whites and teachers and people that came down there to try and make a difference. Talk about that because you were deep diving into these archives and the picture that came back on to you and you can sense it in your book is nightmarish. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as you as you put it, you know, I think 
uh, people don't realize how important the Freedmen's Bureau was. Uh, because it was a short-lived institution, initially wasn't funded well, later it was under radical reconstruction. Um, and, uh, you know, the attitude towards the Freedmen's Bureau has either been that, you know, it didn't matter or that it just didn't do enough, that it was handicapped by the views of, of a northern bourgeois uh, people who inhabited it, the the Union Army soldiers or the you know the the freedmen's agents, the missionaries, etc. That it 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 really was more kind of a social control sort of venue for the freed people, and I just found that completely simplistic and one sided. If you look at the Freedmen's Bureau records, you know everyone talks about it, but I I think rarely do people actually read it and go through it. But if you look at the records of the Freedmen's Bureau in its life, you know, during its lifetime, when it is formed and as it continues until the eight, early 1870s, is what you see is freed people interacting with this bureau. It is, in fact, an, a, a, a first tentative experiment in what today we would call social democracy or modern liberalism. Because when the act is formed, even in its, you know, Sumner had a much more capacious notion of this bureau to make it a permanent agency and uh, permanently funded in the United States government. That did not happen. But even in the manner in which it was formed, it was called the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands in the South, right? So it did lay open some avenue for redistribution of land to lands abandoned or confiscated for non-payment of taxes. And that does happen during the Civil War. Much of the land is kind of redistributed by the Bureau, um, despite, you know, the Bureau's uh, uh, agents uh, notion that, you know, free people should work. Uh, they actually do settle them in abandoned lands and in confiscated lands. Uh, they give a relief not just to free people, but also to Southern whites. It's often forgotten. Southern white refugees are also getting sometimes re relief from the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, but most importantly, the Freedmen's Bureau sees this, sees the Freedmen's Bureau as one government agency like the Union Army that can, and it's closely linked, as you said, with the Union Army, many of the superintendents are former Union Army officers, um, that this is one agency that can intervene between freed people and former enslavers, that they are no longer the tender mercy of local authorities, that there is one place where you could go and complain. Now, it is true, the, you know, agents differed, you know, some were racist and some sided with enslavers and, you know, etc. But just disrupting that all-encompassing power that sometimes local planter politicians in the South wielded over these people was really important. And that's where you get them going to the Freedmen's Bureau with tales and stories, I shouldn't say tales, but stories of how they're being abused and the massive violence that has been unleashed on them by former slaveholders or who refused to accept emancipation, who continue to whip, murder people at will. And that's when the Bureau develops its records of outrages, as they call them. They call them outrages mm -hmm. and it's 19th century term. And then they are, each superintendent, then they would just like record them. And sometimes you could figure out what happens in this case, whether the bureau agent intervened, whether they tried to get some justice for the person. But sometimes it's just a record. And for free people to leave behind that tremendous testimony of just outrageous, barbaric violence that was being meted out um, against them at the moment of freedom, to me, that's much more remarkable than tales of disease, et cetera, that other historians recently have been fixated about, about when it comes to this period, uh, which was also tragic. But to me, this really showed how freed people really take that in their hands and they fashion the Freedmen's Bureau into an area where they can call the local provost marshal to intervene against a local racist Southern judge or local courts uh, or, you know, sometimes they're the same people, the head of the Ku Klux Klan, the employer, 
and the person then who's sitting in the jury or is in the courts, uh, where freed people don't have equal rights, cannot give testimony sometimes uh, against whites. Uh, you know, the old uh, black codes and slave codes make quite certain that they don't have equality before the law. So what was interesting to me was the story of how freed people fashion the Freedmen's Bureau into becoming more than even what, you know, people thought it could do. Uh, and if you were a decent human being and you heard these tales, many times these agents were neither complete racists nor were they abolitionists, right? Not, not all of them were abolitionists. Uh, this notion that somehow all, everyone was an abolitionist became convenient later on, but abolitionists were few and far between, even during Reconstruction. And they were, you know, just like ordinary Union Army soldiers, you know, ordinary Northern white and sometimes Black, um, you know, uh, soldiers uh, in the Union Army. And, and for them to record this, some for some of them it was a transformative experience. It tra radicalized them because they just saw the level of violence and brutality against freed people. So I really wanted to to center that in the story of the Freedmen's Bureau, and in doing so, I center freed people in what I call this process of grassroots reconstruction. Mm -hmm. You know how, are, of course, laws are being passed and amendments are being passed in Washington, but how are freed people actually interpreting this or using it and expanding rights or claiming rights and claiming freedoms was, was an important part of the story. Uh, most people tend to look at the testimony given to the joint uh, commit, select committee on reconstruction. And that is also important because there you have another sort of uh, you know 13 volumes of, of outrages committed all through the South that were recorded by Congress. But preceding that, I think, are the Freedmen's Bureau records. Um, that really galvanizes the need for reconstruction in the South. That, the, that Southern societies, especially Southern white elites, needed to be reconstructed out of their old ways. Uh, and in that sense, free people play a very important part uh, in that process. All those nameless people that no one could ever hear about, all the countless Emmett Till's that no one ever knew in the preceding decades before the 1950s or, yeah, 58, I forget. But um, it's, it's, I'm just curious how that affected you as you were diving into those archives and reading those accounts. You know, I, as I told you, I, I feel that I'm, you know, I've been teaching the spirit for a very long time. Uh, you know, I know some of the primary sources, but even with all that behind me, and even with reading recent books that just concentrate on, on the amount of violence visited on free people, even then, for me, it was eye-opening. The level of it, the ubiquitousness of it, the barbarity behind it. And uh, as one black congressman from South Carolina, Robert Elliott put it, you know, pray who is the barbarian here? You know, because that kind of violence, it's like when you read records about the Holocaust or some awful crime against humanity. And it really, it, it's, it's a bit bone chilling to read that. And it's a bit, it requires some stamina to go through that. And that's why it reminded me a lot of, histories of colonialism that I had read that involved a lot of brutality or mass barbarism uh, by people who claimed to be Christian and civilized, right? Um, and in the South, they certainly saw themselves as sort of God-fearing Christians, and they had defended um, slavery as a biblical institution, etc. But right. you wonder what kind of Christianity, because yeah. the level of barbaric violence, well, what, uh, I mean, the tortures, etc., was just, it's, it's eye-opening. Well, George Bernard Shaw said it was the trouble with Christianity is that nobody's ever tried it. So <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, it, it's like the 14th Amendment, you know, <laughs> stay, stay true to the golden rule and the gospel and you'd be a good Christian. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the other stuff. Yeah, just uh, yeah. Anyway. This book is so rich. It's so deep. You know, one of the things, you know, you know, growing up as a Cold War kid, basically, Capitalism equaled democracy in our mind. You know, when we look at the Soviets and the, the other side of that curtain, you know, capitalism and democracy, but actually, 
you point out in your book that actually the rise of industrial capitalism in large part spelled the demise of an emerging democracy. I do. Uh, and the reason why I have made that equation was because, you know, to make this point that, you know, freedom goes with free markets, it's a very much an ideological point. And you're right, it's really a child of the Cold War and the sort of anti-communist stance of the West, where they argued, well, capitalism and democracy always goes together, you know, greater economic freedom and greater political freedom. But actually, if you look at the history of the West, even the two, Britain and the United States, Anglo-American capitalism, which is seen as, you know, the, the sort of the model for industrial capitalism and the industrial revolution, you see a very different story. Uh, especially in the case of the U.S., where a lot of these workers are immigrants from Southern, Eastern Europe, many coming in also from Asia, from China, many coming in from Latin America, Mexico. These are contract laborers. The conditions that they live in is really bad. Some of the um, uh, efforts to, to disfranchise Black people are being emulated in the North against immigrant workers. Um, and you notice that rights and democracy doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with the rise of capitalism and that sometimes they can be in conflict. And you certainly see this in what was uh, what is known as the Gilded Age, right, the period immediately after Reconstruction. But it's also a story of the unwinding of democracy. Uh, and if you look at the labor movement at this time or the populace, the Knights of Labor or Eugene Debs, uh, American Socialists, you know, all of them are evoking American republicanism. You know, they're evoking Lincoln and Garrison and the abolitionists, and they're not talking about even Marx that much until much later, right? right. Um, maybe some of the immigrant workers bring, you know, uh, some familiarity with, with Marx and, 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 and European traditions of left radicalism. But a lot of these people see it as an attack on American democracy, too. Um, where, you know, troops, instead of safeguarding black rights in the South, are shooting at striking workers, you know. Uh, and you can see this happen, all these so spectacular confrontations between labor and capital in the United States. You see the Supreme Court using the 14th Amendment uh, protections for free people to protect corporations. Right. Which is like, I, I can't imagine a more telling statement than that to protect railroads and corporations from government regulation, saying that their rights are inviolable, even as free people in the South, for whom it was intended, are being shot at, killed, disfranchised, lynched, uh, etc. So um, I really wanted to to tell that story together. The industrial takeoff in the United States uh, after 1870 and the unwinding of Reconstruction. Um, and uh, some of the characters sometimes are the same. Some of them even evoke, uh, you know, what has happened earlier on in Reconstruction. Um, so I wanted to, to make that connection and say capitalism and democracy doesn't necessarily go hand in hand all the time in history. Many times the aims of one conflicts with the aims of the other. Right. I think sort of maybe the best answer is regulated capitalism. You, mm -hmm. you play football, you, there's rules, you know, otherwise you just go destroy each other. Um, yeah. We need a I don't think any of us want lead in our water, although there are some Republican governors I hear who are proposing child labor again. Right. All the things that we thought we got rid of um, are coming back in fashion. So I should never say never nowadays but but you're right i mean the idea of rapacious capitalism and also because you know it leads to this kind of boom and bust economy that mm -hmm. the country was subjected to right up to the great depression you have a boom and then an awful bust and we now because of the new deal and because of government regulations we have now certain protections to protect us from going completely bust so then 2008, we had this massive recession, but the national economy didn't just completely tank because we, we managed to, you know, uh, have some protections. And so I think it's in the interest of everyone, including enlightened capitalists, right. you know, 
to do that are the ones who can't look beyond their nose and the taxes that they have to pay, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt saves capitalism. How? By regulating it, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I mean, you've really tackled such a deep, you know, uh, deep canvas. And you've really it's it's almost like you've created this unified field theory of history where all these currents now come together in a kind of tangible narrative. Um, the current of, you know, reaching back into abolition, you know, through the, this this moment right up to our current second, really. Uh, and also the other forces of reaction of the struggle against it and you know one of the things that's been a challenge for me is like to get my head inside the people that i disagree with or that people that are you know you know what why are they feeling the way they do why are they so strong why have these ideas persisted across now centuries you know in this struggle just to make the world a little fairer do, do, do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's sort of a mystery to me on some level, but you've just done a, a brilliant job with it. Uh, there's so much I could talk about with you. The last sort of thought I have is I know you're from India. You come from an extremely distinguished family of generals and diplomats and uh, professors. And I'm just curious how this American narrative captured Manisha. Yeah, that's a that's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I came to this country when I was twenty one years old mm -hmm. to graduate school to do U.S. history, and I was always fascinated by U.S. history. Uh, I was a history major in in India. I got my bachelor's from Delhi University, and I got really interested in U.S. history for some reason. And part of it was. I was very fascinated by the civil rights movement, the aftermath of the civil rights movement, saw a lot of connections between the fight for um, independence amongst colonies, right? I mean, a lot of the rhetoric, the ideologies, um, the way in which Dr. King evoked Mahatma Gandhi's notion of nonviolent struggle and Satyagraha, there were a lot of, sort of connections. Um, and of course, Dr. King had visited India in the 1950s. My father vividly remembered that uh, and got his idea of affirmative action from the Indian Constitution's reservations for uh, what we call the scheduled costs, uh, costs that are, uh, have been discriminated against for centuries. Um, so there were a lot of these connections between uh, the Black freedom struggle and literal connections. You know, Du Bois corresponded with Nehru and you know, people were aware of, you know, these struggles all around the world. And uh, certainly the civil rights movement sort of was, was seen as kind of part of it. And I got interested in this question of race and democracy in the U.S. Uh, because, you know, it, for most other countries, it became kind of a colonial question, except maybe South Africa, some of the other lingering colonies. But for most European countries, it was a colonial question. But in the U.S., what's so interesting to me is that the question is right here. It's within the republic. And it's also a republic founded on, on these incredible ideals of universal individual equality and freedom. Um, and so how do you tell those stories, those competing stories? I mean, earlier on, we had like all those myths of American exceptionalism, right? America was, and that was, you know, obviously not entirely uh, plausible or correct. But now we have gone completely 180 degrees where everything's about racism. Everything's racist. Nothing was good. It was, and I think that's just as simplistic to me. And that's why I tell this uh, story in the introduction as a great contest, because the contest is there in every place. It's in the United States. It's been there all through the world. There are no particular people who are somehow unusually politically virtuous as the British imagined themselves uh, to be, or maybe some you know, American exceptionalists think of the American Republic as. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not as if, you know, that everything is always bad. I think when India became independent, we realized what we liked about the British system of governance and what we didn't like about British colonialism. Mm -hmm. And each country, I think, has to make that choice. And within the United States, there's a lot to admire, too. Uh, 
you know, of the past. I mean, as you said, people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, and they're all heroes of mine, you know. Uh, yeah. So it's not all one or the other. And and so I like that. I like that about the U.S. And I like being, um, I think, being brought up in India and being educated there. I'm now, of course, a naturalized citizen in the United States. I've lived here longer than I lived in my mother country. Uh, so the typical immigrant experience, I feel very much at home in the United States. Um, you know, my children were born here. Uh, my family is now here. But uh, I think what it does give me is an angle on U.S. history from a perspective that I may not have gotten if I was completely born and raised here. Um, so sometimes, like in my abolition book, when I looked at what Garrison is saying about the 1857 revolt in India, I think it didn't really interest you as historians, but it interested me when I was reading Garrison. And, you know, 19th century Americans are far more cosmopolitan and far more aware of what's happening in the world than the ways in which their histories have been written. Uh, so I, that's why I like doing U.S. history, because I come across these amazing connections, some now that are well known, like Gandhi and MLK, but, you know, it precedes them. There's there's so much more. I tell you what about. blows me away is that yeah. Gandhi in South Africa corresponds with Tolstoy, you know, letters to a Hindu. Uh, Tolstoy, so Gandhi creates his ashram and begins this experiment in civil disobedience in South Africa. He's reading Tolstoy, corresponding with him, who writes The Kingdom of God is Within You, this massive, unreadable treatise about nonviolence. You know, if you're going to have to read Anna Karenina or this one, you stick with the Karenina. <laughs> and then he's influenced by these American abolitionists. Absolutely. And, and it's like, whoa, you, you know, yeah. this huge circle uh, that is, you know, completed. I mean, there's so much to talk about. It's such a rich canvas. It's, in, you know, the people that I've known, you know, were clearly, you know, influenced by this stuff. It's it's so incredible. And of course, India today probably has its own challenges, you know, with oh, yeah. its own democracy. Yeah. We have our own child. I, I think nearly every nation, even in Europe, the mm. the right, the right in Europe, and and the way in which they're cheerleading Trump, uh, and the way Putin and Xi form this kind of authoritarian axis, which is cheerleading authoritarianism in all these different countries. We have our own challenges now that you know confronting with confronting a kind of. Um, a kind of religious nationalism that is intolerant and that might challenge our, um, our identity as a secular nation. Because we, unlike Israel or Pakistan or country, we are not for, founded on a religion, even though an overwhelming majority of the population is Hindu. And I think it'll be very dangerous if we follow these theocratic kind of states where, you know, you, you identify. I, that's why I think the tradition of secularism with all its problems, I think it's still the way to go. The French laïcité, the the American separation of church and state, um, you know, the British respect for certain personal religious freedoms born out of, you know, European, all those awful religious wars between Catholics and Protestants. And so I think there's something that we can learn, you know, in that sense. But you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a small world. I, you know, I, in my, previous book on the abolitionist international i'm like here's thoreau writings on civil disobedience and his writers right, being circulated amongst europeans like tolstoy and getting to gandhi in this book what was interesting to me was when plessy is is it's thrown out out of racial segre uh, of a racially segregated car in you know and that leads to plessy versus ferguson you know a couple of years later it's gandhi who's thrown right. out in South africa and i'm like well, and then I looked at all the massacres, um, you know, the Tulsa massacre and other, but the British perpetrated this enormous massacre in India around the same time in 1919, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre that everyone knows about in India. So there are a lot of similarities, you know, there are more similarities in our history. They're not the, exactly the same, but sometimes these things are happening at the same time. And I think today we can appreciate it looking at the rise of the global right everywhere.
Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, especially I think in Europe, um, you know, uh, even in countries like Germany that have had such a <laughs> awful history of, of Nazism and the Holocaust, there's a right wing party that is alive and well and has some, you know, political power in the East. Um, the right is in power in Italy. They're am amping up in France and, and being encouraged by Putin and other authoritarian forces. So I do think this great contest that I describe in this book within the United States is an ongoing one in, in, in world history and in U.S. history. I mean, today we have Trump and an entire party uh, devoted to not following democratic norms. That's very dangerous in a republic. If you're not going to uh, accept the results of elections, you don't follow democratic norms, you think everything goes, you know, the king can do no wrong and all that, uh, you have lost the republic. And and that's, I, I in a way, when I was finishing that this book, uh, that was always at the back of my mind, you know, because we historians write in the times that we write in. Um, and 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 I, I want Americans to read this book and be aware of the danger and what can happen if you lose democracy. You know, what happened in the South uh, it was, as Rayford Logan, the great Black historian, said, the nadir, not just in Black history, but in the history of American democracy. Well, you have done an incredibly important piece of work here. You know, this book, and I recommend, of course, The Slave's Cause as a predecessor, although it takes you right to 19, and then the, this, the Second American Republic. You've done something that I think is so important where you have discarded the mythology of our history and embraced the truth of our history with clearly hard, scholarly labor. You don't get to these places that easily. So I want to first congratulate you on this incredible accomplishment. And it, it has the flourish of also an inspired novelist, as well as the detail of, of, of history. And I want to not only congratulate you, but encourage others to read The Second American Republic um, by Manisha Sinha. It's an important piece of work. And, uh, you know, the name of my podcast is The Rebel Without Applause. And I feel like I live a lot of my life without any kind of applause as a comedian and otherwise. But I want to just give you that moment, at least with me, how much I appreciate what you've done. So there you go. And I will extend those thoughts on Amazon, I guess, right? Is it, 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 Yes, we will do that for sure. So Manisha Sinha, Professor Manisha Sinha, thank you once again. It's so interesting. I could spend all day, but there's probably 15 other podcasters waiting for you uh, to hear this wisdom. So uh, just congratulations. Stay on the other side so I can say goodbye to you, but I will just uh, conclude this by saying to all my friends, read the book. Thanks for joining me. Till next time. Namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that I mean namashaloha. 